Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy, and today in our virtual studios, we have Helen Patton, who is an advisory CISO at Cisco. This is going to be interesting because she's had a lot of background. She's got a blog, she's writing, she's speaking, and can kind of help us see, like, is there a life after being a CISO? And I think you even had an entry, uh, something you wrote about that. Uh, but for everybody who's listening in, thank you for being part of our CISO Tradecraft audience. If you have not, please go ahead and subscribe and share with your friends and your other professional who, where they get their information from, because we'd love to have more subscribers. So anyway, Helen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So and we were talking a little bit earlier before the show and things such as that. And so you know, listening to you, you come a little bit uh, Australian, but you said you're not really Australian. So could you uh, kind of help us understand that a little bit? That would be kind of a fun <laughs> place to start. Sure. So I grew up in Australia, in the country, in the 70s and 80s before most people were thinking about computers. I certainly wasn't. And somewhere along the line, I bumped into this Navy guy from Columbus, Ohio. And fast forward six or so months, and I find myself in Columbus, Ohio, and I've been here ever since. So yeah, uh, more American than Australian at this point, but still carrying the flag for both countries. Well, that's wonderful. And of course, I got to salute you for uh, heading off with a, a Navy man. That's probably yeah. a, a good, you know, being being Navy myself, a little bit biased. But. <laughs> yeah, it worked for us. <laughs> so so that got you to the U.S. and it got you to Ohio. But uh, what got you into cybersecurity? I mean, did you start out that way? I mean, did you, did you grow up hacking things down in Australia? And No, I thought I'd be a landscape architect. It was all by accident. My entire career has been a series of accidents waiting to happen. Even when I intentionally moved to a new role, something would change on accident and and I would find myself doing a new thing. When I moved to the United States, I had a dubious employment status. And so I took a number of jobs around town trying to work out which end was up and what it was like to live in the United States and all of those things. I ended up working for an organization that was going through a data conversion from this old IBM 36 mini mainframe to this newfangled Windows 311 Ooh. SQL something, something, <laughs> client server something. And I was the only person in the office under the age of about 30. And so they figured I must know something about this. So they paired me up with the company that did the work who ultimately offered me a job. And so that got me into IT and that was the early 90s. And then at sort of towards the end of the 90s was when we started seeing all the I love you viruses and Melissa worms and this and that and the other thing and Northeast power outages and 9-11 and whatever. And the CIO I was reporting to at the time said, oh, we need a security program. Helen, you're it. And so, yay. And then I went to JP Morgan pretty shortly after that. And that sort of started my corporate path. So things were accidents all the way along. That's So don't, don't follow me. I have no idea where I'm going. So, so you're voluntold to <laughs> be into security and that kind of got you going. Yeah. But as you went into the corporate world, like a JP Morgan, what did you see differently working for both financial as well as large corporation? And then you know, now that you've had a number of years and some experience. Not everybody here has that privilege to work in a large organization. I'll use the word privilege perhaps uh, either loosely because some people think it's horrible and other people don't. But yeah. uh, what, what are your thoughts on what makes you successful in a corporate environment like that in the security world? Yeah, it's sort of interesting. The larger the organization and the older the organization, the more the organization depends on process to get things done. And when you're a cog in that wheel, sometimes the processes can feel really oppressive and constraining. So if you see a bad process and you want to fix it, it's a it's an effort to fix a bad process because they typically really, really ingrained. Whereas when you're in a smaller organization, a startup, just you know some something with you know two hundred people or less, there is an expectation that you're going to do things new all the time. So to succeed in a large organization, you've got to work out how to leverage process and leverage relationship 
to get things done in ways that you don't have to in a smaller organization. I actually prefer working in a bigger organization than a smaller one because a part of me wants good process. I'm a process driven person. I want dependability. I want predictability, but I also want the capability of being able to change things when they need to be changed as well. So for me, big organizations feed both of those needs. And to be honest, smaller organizations are a little bit riskier than my personal risk profile supports. So for me, big is good. Big is good. And, and that makes good sense. So kind of reiterating what you had said, a combination of process and relationships were the two mm-hmm. things that I heard you say mm-hmm. are going to be key in larger organizations. And as you had said, in smaller ones, perhaps not so much. Not as yeah. many people with whom to have relationships, probably a little bit more just shout across the, the cubicle or across the garage, depending upon how big you are. And right. it's just kind of a different environment. But one of the things you had not mentioned mm-hmm. had to do with well, security and the technical stuff. Now, <laughs> as, a, as a CISO or CISO or CISO or however you want to pronounce that, we find ourselves in some ways, many of us came from a very technical background. Some of us came from a governance and other people came from even legal, if you will, to say, hey, go, go do this and the like. But what has your observation been in terms of the importance of technical acumen by the time you become a CISO? I think technical acumen is still really important for a CISO, but but you use it in different ways. The larger the organization and the, the more CISO issue you get, there are people with a title of CISO that do the turning of the screws kinds of technical work. It, smaller organizations in particular, you tend to wear many hats and you also have a title of the CISO. You get into a large organization, a Fortune 100 company, a CISO in that space is not turning the screws. They're not doing the work of engineering or, or, or vulnerability management or whatever it is, but they need to know what that work is. They need to know how it fits in the general oversight of the entire organization. They can't you can't be a CISO and not be technical to a certain degree. But again, the application of that knowledge is where the difference is between, say, a CISO and an analyst or an engineer with five years of experience. I get a little frustrated. We talk about, you know, trying to get people into cybersecurity and some people will, will say to, to, to people thinking about getting into cyber, don't worry, you don't need to be too technical. Like being technical would scare them off. And I think they're doing people a disservice when they when they say that. I think, yes, you need to be technical, but technology isn't hard. It's not hard. So, and and there's different kinds of ways of expressing that technical capability. And, uh, and, and I think as a CISO, it does tend these days more towards the governance and oversight elements, but you still need that tech background regardless. I will agree with you on that one because you know, we mentioned Navy earlier. Well, for me as a naval officer, as a lieutenant, you're going to be exhibiting your technical skills, whether it's flying an aircraft, whether it's driving a ship, it's work, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and that's true across most of the military and things such as that. If you're a tank operator in the Army or if you're, you're in the Marines as part of a, a platoon. But by the time you get up to the point where you're a general or an admiral, you're not out there doing these things as much as you might miss that. <laughs> yes. And it's kind of like, I remember the good old days when I could do this <laughs> stuff. And that's, yeah, that's in your back would let you do it. But more to the point, I think the reason, for example, in the military, you don't see lateral transfers. You don't see an ad in the USA Today saying, wanted, vice admiral, corporate experience, valuable, military not experience, not necessary. They don't do that. No. Uh, but, but what they do is you say, well, hey, I understand what's involved in force projection. I understand the technology of what's out there. And though I may no longer work it personally, that context having built up over a number of literally years uh, provides then the grounding of being able to make wise decisions and knowing when to listen and when to act. Would That's you say right. that that probably translates well over in the business world as well, particularly in security? Yeah, particularly in security because you know, we're, we're, it's a trope, but there's some truth to it that 
it's still a pretty young profession. It, people have been doing security for forever, but as a profession as we know it today, it's still pretty young. And people around us don't really know how to do security and don't really know how to do it very well. And so the role of a CISO is often just translating from the business side to the security side and back again and being able to make those those leaps. So you you can't it's very hard to come in to a senior security role without having a security background because there is a lot of experience and nuance that goes along with the territory. So it's particularly hard. I think over time that will change as more schools put cybersecurity into their MBA programs, for example, as as other executives have to think about security more than they do today. I think it'll be easier, but we're not there yet. So right now security is still very much a specialized skill. I, I think so too. And what we find though is that it tends to reach a lot of elements of most organizations. It used to be that security when i started doing it i was i was the security person i was with a consulting company i think we had 4000 consultants and one did security so be, <laughs> I, I, it was like being captain of a canoe right you know i'm yeah. i'm the director of the security practice well who is it well you're looking at it <laughs> and then of course it grew and it grew and off it went so it's interesting being there earlier but as you get to the larger organizations as we had t- referred to earlier where the process and the relationships become important what we're finding then is that sense to suggest some sort of structure, having a career path that exposes you to technology, brings you up into that area, processes, repeatable activities that ensure that we can do that and things such as that. And it sounds like it's a type of a structure that would be, well, kind of comforting in a way, although inside it, it's, it's very hectic. And yet I remember reading a quote from a famous person in security saying, if you're looking for hard and fast rules, boundaries, and certainty, don't do information security. Do you remember ever? Uh, yeah, writing? I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, you remember writing that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I remember saying it. It's, it's true. I think where my head's at at the moment is when you're managing a security program, you're not managing just, and, and I know the word just is a bit diminutive and I don't mean it that way. You're not managing just a process of doing security things. You're actually having to manage an entire environment. So when, when, when you look at breaches and where things have gone wrong in an organization that's led to a, a breach event or an incident, let's just call it an incident, usually there's not one thing that happened. You, there's no beginning point where you can point your finger and go, aha, if that thing hadn't happened, this whole chain of events wouldn't have happened. It's not that. It's it's the, it's a, a combination of people and process and culture and politics and money and all those things. And so when you're a CISO, you're not just managing your security function, although you're doing that. You're also having to keep your eye on the entire environment, which, by the way, these days isn't just your immediate company. It's also your entire supply chain. So you you have to have this really high level, like admiral level situational awareness of what's going on in your world in order to be able to give good guidance to your partners and to your CEOs and your boards and so forth about what they should be doing about it. And internal to the organization where you have boards, which are you know, mostly yeah, internal, I guess. Most people are kind of external uh, board members, but they still focus on that. At least that's what they, they get compensated. Of course, officers, employees, and things such as that. So in a certain way, you have a captive audience. But as I like to point out to people, how many individuals in your organization can screw things up with a computer? And the answer is pretty much everyone. And then how many of them work for you? And it's very almost none of them. And so therefore, the ability to have a direct authority to communicate, to implement, and to enforce doesn't exist. No. And so as a CISO, how do you, how do you get things done? How do you make sure this stuff gets done correctly? Ah, it's the art of the influence. And it's also... Again, it's having that situational awareness of of where things are headed, where you want things to head, what the purpose of the organization is, how that organization fit, fits into its ecosystem. It's all of those things. But but as you're trying to influence that those things be done in a secure way, because security, I think we talked about previously, is, is an adjective, not a verb, right? So in order for things to be done with security in mind, 
you as a CISO, you're right, you don't have authority to tell anybody what to do. So you've got to convince them that doing things in a secure way is in their interest and then help them understand how to do those things in a secure way, in a way that serves their interests. So very much the art of, of um, influencing without authority and and dare I say it's some politics that goes along with it. I know a lot of people think politics is a dirty word, but politics to me is 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 neutral in terms of ethics. It's just a way of getting things done. And I think as CISOs, we employ it. Yeah, and I think for our technical folks, we call that layer eight. Yeah, uh, right seven on. layer OSI model, layer eight is politics, yeah. and it, it explains a lot. And that competency at the political level usually is not that valuable. You don't need a politically aware lieutenant, for example. It's just go out there and fly your airplane. But by the time you're up there, or if you're a captain trying to make admiral or whatever, you really need to be tuned into those politics. And if you're going to be a senior vice president, large organization, at some point, there's a threshold where just being a good, strong leader isn't sufficient to help you get to the next level. Do you have any sense for where that transition is in larger organizations where you think back a little bit and said, I did really well technically when I got started. Then I got to manage stuff. Then I got to lead stuff. But at some point, it was my political acumen that allowed me to really be successful in this role. And then the question I'm trying to get to is, is the job of CISO on this side or the other side of that event horizon of becoming politically aware and competent? Again, I think it depends on the size of the company, but typically I would put it on the other side of that event horizon. I think there are, there are, I used to say there were two major events in a person's career and not specific to security. One was that when they became a manager of people, because to go from being a technical expert to then managing people and having to enable people to do jobs, but not do the jobs for them and, and all of those things takes a mind shift change. So becoming a becoming a manager of people is a milestone in a career. Not that I'm saying everybody who wants a really strong career has to manage people. They don't, but it's a thing. And then when you become a manager of managers, that is also another mindset change. And And I think you're right. This third thing is when do you change your mindset again to be about not even thinking about managing a team of people to achieve an outcome so much as influencing a an ecosystem of allies to get where you need to go. That's a third mind shift again, absolutely. And I think CISOs these days, particularly of larger companies, have gone past that third threshold at that point. Okay. So that's an interesting concept that you brought up there about being able to be uh, proficient in the politics at that point, and really as a CISO in a larger organization, that does become then a competency that's a requirement. Now, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, where do you go to get that? I can't go to the, the doctor and say, I need 100 cc's of political awareness, thank you very much. Nor can you typically go to a lot of the resources that are out there, certainly not the technical, and even you know MBAs. I didn't learn anything in my MBA program really about politics. Is this something that's pretty much just on the job training and you get it or you don't? Or is there a better way? Yeah, it, it, it is mostly on the job. And I would tell you, for anyone who's listening who's worked with me, they're going to be saying, Helen, you ain't got it yet either. Um, I think it's something that you continuously learn. And I think how to be effective in an organization also depends on your own style and personality and how it relates to the organization you're in. So you could take a person who does really well in one organization. If they do the same thing in a different organization, they're going to fail. So there's a lot of contextual awareness that has to go around that competency as well to be able to say, in this organization, I can push harder and it's perceived as a strength. In this organization over here, I push harder and I'm seen as a, a, I'm an I'm just pushy. So you've you've got to be able to read the tea leaves in terms of what's acceptable within the culture that you're working in. And being able to read those tea leaves is a skill you can't learn in school. It's something that you learn on the job from the beginning of your career onwards. It's not just something you get as a leader. It's just it becomes more important the further up the chain you go, I think. And what that brings up then is the opportunity for, well, ideally finding a mentor. 
because right. somebody who has cracked the code is on the other side of that event horizon, as I kind of chose to describe it, and then says, hey, this uh, up and coming executive named Helen, she looks like she's got her act together. Uh, I like to kind of reach out and, and do something. Now, sometimes mentors approach you. And that means you must be sending out the right signals, and it's usually signals of future success. Mm -hmm. But what if you have not had anybody approach you saying, hey, I'm going to make you a millionaire. I'm going to make you a movie star. What do we do? Yeah, I think on the job, asking for feedback, although it, it makes you vulnerable politically to ask for feedback, but I think asking for feedback is the way to begin that. If you, sh if you demonstrate to people around you that you're open to getting real-time reflective, constructive information about what you're doing well and what you're not doing well, what resonates and what doesn't resonate is a really great way of doing it. So mentors are great because there's a specific skill you know you need and you can find someone who does that well and you can go and ask them. But really the 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 benefit is having someone who sees you every day and, and being remote makes this more difficult too. But someone who sees you every day and can say, today you did that really well. Tomorrow you didn't do that quite so well and here's why I think so. So it's not really, I think, as necessary to have a singular mentor who's like the gold standard that you want to achieve so much as you've got two or three people around you that you trust well enough that can be that mirror for you, can be much more useful. So there's that. I think this, the second area is just networking in general, like having a group of people who maybe don't work with you, who maybe you don't see every day, but are in your industry at a certain, they're sort of at your level doing similar sorts of things to you that you can go to them and say, hey, I've got to, get, I've got to make this thing happen. I'm thinking about doing this way. What do you think? Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it's a good strategy? And and having sort of a sounding board to bounce ideas off of where they don't have any skin in the game about whether or not you're successful can also be a really great tool to leverage. Right. I think Napoleon Hill would call that a mastermind group. Yes. Where you find people whom you can rely on and their insights and meet regularly and solicit that. So that's great. So at this point in time, someone has developed their technical skills, their management skills, their leadership skills, and they've figured out maybe through a mentorship or mastermind uh, the political skills. Ta-da, you're in here. You're working as a CISO. You're, you're getting all of the fun, all the gray hairs and all the challenges, but you're adding value. But one of the things that seems to be a characteristic of CISOs is they don't stick around for 20 years. It's not the sort of thing where you go to and said, I'm going to retire in this job. I'm going to be the one dentist in this small town. And I'm going to keep doing stuff till I'm 90 years old. And you could do that in some careers. But usually, let's assume nothing horrible goes wrong on your watch. Things don't blow up. You don't end up with some, some massive breach. But at some point in time, you look around and go, I've been here a while. And uh, do I, does it still make sense for me to continue to be here? Uh, I think you went through that at one point in your career, and, and would you like to share some of your thoughts and insights on that? Yeah, for sure. So when I was the CISO at the Ohio State University, the, we now trade today, trademark that, the Ohio State University, I thought going in I'd be there about three years. And going in, my mandate, the ask of the people who hired me into the role was to build the security program. So they had one, but it was small and it, it wasn't quite what they wanted it to be. And so they asked me to come in and build it. And coming out of a Wall Street bank, I'm like, yeah, it's about a three-year gig. And I ended up being there for eight, as it turned out. And there were a number of factors as to why I was there that long. One, it, it took longer. What I didn't appreciate about going into higher ed is that it was really not a top-down command control kind of organization. It was a bottom-up grassroots kind of change that had to occur. That takes longer. It was a much more complicated environment that I that I inherited. I thought it was kids in classrooms and it was like more like a city. So that took longer. So there was there were a whole bunch of challenges that made the length longer, but I also really liked the environment. So I could have certainly left after three years or four, but I felt I was still learning things. I was I, I, I love teaching and being around students. They bring a certain kind of energy that you can't get anywhere else. And so there was a lot of reasons for me to stay. But ultimately, I did hit this point where I was like, the reason that I came here, I've achieved that. 
I've hit a point where I feel like the value I'm bringing to the organization is starting to decrease. Not that I wasn't bringing any value, but it was just sort of plateauing. I felt like I, I had I'd grown as much as I could grow in the role. And so it was time for me to look. But I was very intentional about that like I because every time you change a job it's not just yourself that you're messing around it's all the people you work with and your family and everybody else so I don't take lightly the idea of leaving an organization which is why I was at 10 years at JP Morgan and I was eight years at 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 Ohio State and I don't know how long I'll be here at Cisco so yeah it's uh to me that especially when you're in a CISO role moving around is is not something you that you do on a whim. But I think being very clear about why you take a role in the beginning and being able to say, did I did I achieve what I set out to do is probably the main reason to make a change. And that suggests that when accepting a CISO role, that at least individually, if not communicating to your employer, you should have some goals in mind. Uh, if uh, kind of like Yogi Berra, if you don't know where you're going, you're sure to get there. Yep. Meaning that wherever you end up, hey, I, I, I could have been here. I guess this is where I'm going to. So having that set of discrete goals, and as you had said, three-year planning horizon is probably about as far out as we could go in the cybersecurity world because things change so quickly. Yep. And therefore saying, well, I got a 10-year security plan. I don't believe it. No. Uh, it, I, it it's great, but it's fiction. Yep. Now, you might be lucky and one out of a thousand people might call all the turns correctly, but that's not what you look for. What we do is we align, we adjust, and things such as that. Now, when you went to Cisco and now you're at the as an advisory CISO, so that, that's kind of interesting. So let's talk a little bit about, well, did, did Cisco come looking for you? Did you go find them? And then how and what is an advisory CISO? <laughs> yeah, actually, they came to me first. And so Wendy Nather is my boss. Um, she's amazing. She is a person that I would want to work for. So check one. But when she was a duo, before duo bought Cisco, she came to me and said, hey, would you like to be part of my team? And at the time, I felt like I wasn't done with the things I wanted to do at Ohio State. So I said, I am so flattered, but I can't make the move right now. And there were a couple of other things behind that. One, it would have meant working remotely. And I had never worked remotely before. And I wasn't sure about that. And two, it was working for a small organization. And I was like, mm, I'm not sure that's my gig. Well, fast forward two or three years. Now I'm working from home. Thank you very much, COVID. And I'd been doing it for two years and that felt fine. Cisco had bought Duo. And so it was now a big organization again. Yay. And I was done with what I needed to be doing at Ohio State. And so, yeah, they came looking for me, but this was also a really great opportunity for me because I was sort of done with being an operational CISO. I didn't want to go from being a CISO to another CISO, operational CISO role again. And this role as an advisory CISO gives me the opportunity to still work with a whole bunch of CISOs internationally, not just within the Big Ten, which is what I was doing at Ohio State, working with some really smart, amazing people doing really interesting security work, which which fed my sort of chronic need to continue learning and growing and and I I I'm not on a 24 by 7 on call anymore it was like yay so there were a lot of reasons why this was a really good next step for me after being a CISO now having said that I've talked to a lot of CISOs who've been CISOs have said I don't want to be a CISO anymore gone to an, a, a different kind of role and then the pendulum has swung back again and so I could see that being something potentially in my future as well, because the longer you stay away from being a CISO, the 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 more out of touch you feel with what's actually happening in the trenches. And for a lot of CISOs who came out of the trenches to be a CISO, that's where they're most comfortable. And I'm the, I'm in the same boat. So we'll see how long I stay in this role. For I I love Cisco, so I'm I'm happy to stay at Cisco as long as they want me. But whether I stay as an advisory CISO, we'll see. I'll agree with you on, on it being a great company, although I never worked for Cisco directly back in 03. I had a chance to do a number of security seminars. And what was interesting is Cisco had bought Okina. It was their first foray into the cybersecurity world to try to rebrand. We're no longer just the infrastructure company, but Cisco is a security company. And so what happened was, is that my 
mission was to go out there and do vendor neutral keynotes and presentations to kind of lay that groundwork. And then ultimately we ended up working with John Stewart, chief security officer. I guess he re- left and he's now kind of doing his own VC thing. So he did quite well. But we did executive meetings at Morton Steakhouse, red meat and red wine and wood paneling and no PowerPoint, following up on the same cities that we had talked to the technical people a few weeks, maybe a couple months earlier, who had validated and you know, get back and they go, hey, Alan, what do you think about this guy, you know, this, this product from Cisco? Oh, man, boss, we've been playing with it for two months. We love it. Oh, it works pretty well. And so from that perspective, we find out that having that feedback loop, having the validation of your ideas worked well. And so Cisco's had a good, strong, positive presence in the security world for almost 20 years now. And, and it's been the result of some early pioneering work in there and some, I think, some wise business decisions. But the other thing I learned back then is that this is a momentum career. Because what had happened was, is after doing this and doing quite well, I thought I was in the public speaking circuit. I was doing a lot of stuff. It was I was um, making ridiculous amounts of money, which is always fun to do at least once in life. And then I got pulled back on active duty for almost 500 days to stand up the Center for Naval Leadership. And I've always had a passion for leadership and teaching folks. And I had the privilege to, to build a school in the course of about a year and a half that would train 10,000 sailors a year. I had about 170 instructors. And as a startup, you go and you look at that run rate, you say, wow, that would be about a 40 or $50 million company. But in the military, you get a medal and they say, there you go. So, <laughs> yeah. But the point was this, when I came back after almost two years of building something that I thought added a tremendous amount of value to the military, then I couldn't get my speaking business going again because it reminded me of the quote they say about Hollywood. The biggest mistake you can make is to let them forget about you. Yeah. So now for a CISO who says, I need a sabbatical, I've been technical, now manager, now leader, now CISO, and I need a break, or you go do something orthogonal to CISOing, if there is such a word, and you come back in a couple of years and you reflect in that the rapid change of technology. And again, I've said this a few broadcasts, but I published this 20 years ago. You know, G. Mark's Law, half of what you know about security is obsolete in 18 months. And do you run the risk of letting them forget about you? Can you be a different track for a couple of years? And all of a sudden you come back and you find out that the train is stationed down the tracks and it's still moving away and, and you're kind of lost. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, th- I think that is a risk you run. And I think some of that is outside of your control in that if the technology environment or the business environment changes around you dramatically while you're gone, it's hard to stay on top of that. So people who've, like me, who've decided to take a sideways move in the middle of COVID, in some industries, post-COVID and pre-COVID don't look that different. And in some industries, it's really different. So I think there's there are going to be some folks who struggle to get back on the train if they want to get back on the train. But I think there's ways to manage that. I was mindful of that as, as I made this decision to move into the role I'm in now. One of the reasons I like this role, even though it's not operational, I am still ver- working very closely with people who are operational within Cisco, but also with our customers and the broader community. And so I'm staying in touch with what the issues are and what the technologies are and those kinds of things. So hopefully I've, I haven't gone so far that I'm unknown or, or forgotten about, but it, yeah, it would definitely take me having a, a bit of a, an uphill climb from a skills perspective to climb back in the saddle to mix all of my analogies. But I know that. So I, I just have to plan that into whatever I do next, I think. And I think that's, that's good wisdom for anybody to say that it's a survivable move and it just requires perhaps a little bit of extra effort. It's like saying, hey, I've been a marathon runner and I've, I've run races, but if I take two years off of running, I, I'm not going to go out and run a half marathon tomorrow. I'm going to be out nope. chugging maybe a mile out of breath, and then it's going to take a while to get back up to speed. That's right. So I think, I think that's the way to think about it is you just got out of shape, but you didn't become disqualified. That's right. But, but one of the cool things you've had a chance probably do at Cisco, and they've come up with some really interesting things. They said that they've been involved as a leader in the security world, uh, thought leadership now for almost 20 years, is a Cisco security outcome study. 
And in that particular study came out in 2021, looked at 25 general security practices, but found basically five of them that really stood out. The Fab Five, as I think you've called. Should we talk about those a little bit? We'll kind yeah, of see. Yeah, let's do uh, that. Yeah. So the, the first one is a proactive tech refresh. Now, I think a proactive tech refresh, and I'm saying, wait a minute, that's um, that's not a cybersecurity specific function, is it? I mean, why is that on the list? No, it's not. But I will tell you, as the CISO at Ohio State, it was it was one of those things that I I dealt with a lot. And when I talk to our customers in the broader security community, it it is always an issue. We what, another way of thinking about this is technical debt. Like, how much technical debt do you have? And I've seen reports that have said of an just an IT budget. Forget a security budget for a moment. The average company spends forty percent of their IT budget just maintaining technical debt. Like so, and that's money that can't be put towards innovations and so forth. In the security world, what the security outcome study really showed was the more modern your tech stack was, not just your security tech stack, but your tech stack in general, the more modern it was, the more likely you were to have positive security outcomes. So you're right, the security, the CISO may not have authority over the refresh schedule. I certainly didn't when I was the operational CISO, but it is a place where the CISO needs to focus their influence to try to get things moved forward. And in the second version of the study, we delved into it a little bit deep, more deeply. It's not just about going to cloud. What we did find was if you had a modern tech stack that was on-prem, it was equally as likely to have a positive outcome as a modern tech stack that was in the cloud. So it's not the location of the tech stack that is the issue. But what we did find was more companies that are going to are using cloud as the way of modernizing their tech stack. So it feels like there's a correlation between going to the cloud and being more secure through that lens. But that's actually underneath the data, that's not the case. But it's also easier to keep your tech stack refreshed if it's in the cloud than if it's on-prem. Once it's on-prem, we tend to set it and forget it. And once it's in the cloud and you're dealing with a SaaS vendor who's just automatically refreshing the code or whatever, it's just easier to stay on top of it. So that's a, another piece of that to think about. Good insight. Now, the second one is well-integrated technology. Now, of mm. course, my first thought is if you're working for a security vendor, isn't the prime directive to make sure you do not work well with your comp competition or other <laughs> security vendors? I mean, we used to see that in the early days of antivirus where they kill mm -hmm. each other and you have this yep. little war going on in your laptop. But uh, how, how does that fit into number two there in their Fab Five? Yeah. So what we're talking about there is having a security tech stack that's integrated enough with the rest of the tech stack that you can see what's happening in the tech stack. So, you know, it does you no good to have you know, network firewalls, for example, if you've got a whole bunch of users who are working from home using a SaaS app and your tech, your security controls don't even touch it, which is where we're getting into things like SASE, right? The integration piece there is about integrating the security tools you have with the rest of your, your technology stack that you already have and getting your security controls as close to where the data and the users are as possible. That's sort of where we're headed with that particular comment. Now, the interesting thing there is we we still end up, there. there is certainly a security philosophy that says you don't want to be using the same tools that you use to run your production environments to do your security because if one's compromised, you won't have the security oversight to be able to see it. So the, the suggestion here isn't that it's the same vendor that does all of it. It is just that you make sure that you've got the right integrations between your production environments and your security stack so that you can see when things are happening. Makes good sense. Now, the next two are timely incident response and accurate threat detection. Now, I see detect and respond in there. I am first immediately go to the NIST cybersecurity model, and I go, wait, wait, they're out of order here. But yeah, but those two are also in the top five of the 25. So yeah. why are they so important? So the thing to remember, if you haven't read the reports yet, is that the the positive outcomes that people said they wanted from a security program was one, enabling the business, two, reducing risk, and three, being as efficient as possible. And if you think in terms of enabling the business and reducing risk, being able to see as quickly as possible when things were going wobbly in your organization 
was a business enabler. So you need to have good threat detection in order to be able to proactively identify when things are happening. So that's the first. And then once you do that, being able to respond to it particularly quickly is, of course, the the second side of that coin. So you, you in order to have a, a business that's enabled to do what the business needs to do and to reduce your risk, you really need both of those things. And so that's why they ended up in the top five together. Right. And then the last one, prompt disaster recovery. So now we've, we've got uh, uh, detect, respond, recover. Recover, yeah. And I feel like identify, identify and protect ought to be in there somehow, maybe back the other ones. Are. So first of all, yeah. let's talk about prompt disaster recovery. Then we say, is this just a sideways view of actually revalidating the cybersecurity framework? Or is that I suspect there might be a little bit of uh, different or greater wisdom in here on that? Yeah. So, so again, in the second version of the report, we delved into these top five to see what it was about these top five. One of the things I thought was interesting, this Disaster recovery piece really lends itself to all the conversation we're hearing in the industry around resilience, right? How do we, we know that bad things are going to happen. When they do, how do we minimize the impact? Well, some of that's timely response, but not all of it's timely response. And then how do we bounce back better, stronger, faster post incident, right? So one of the things we found was a CISO could not run disaster recovery on their own. So there has to be partnership with the business continuity parts of the business, the emergency response parts of the business, if you have that. And board level engagement was really important in in supporting good security outcomes as well. And there seemed to be a threshold that said you needed to have disaster recovery and business continuity oversight over at least 80% of the business for it to be effective functionally. So you couldn't just do disaster recovery for one little piece of the pie and forget about the rest. You're going to have to have most of the pie covered for, from a disaster recovery perspective. Um, the other thing that, that got into this was how do you test it and how often do you test your capabilities around recovery? Um, and again, the more often people were testing the better their security outcomes were. And so we were getting into things like chaos engineering and those kinds of things as tools that CISOs could use to support having better outcomes from the beginning. So we're going to have our own simian armies uh, going ahead and uh, <laughs> yeah. knocking, knocking things askew when we least expect it. I think Absolutely. we, yeah, we also have uh, lots of other people who do that, uh, not even paid to do it. They just kind of. They do it. Out of the Clumsy goodness of the people heart. people make mistakes. The goodness of the heart. Right. There's always something good about every mistake. Well, anyway, this has been fascinating. This has really been a wonderful thought. Uh, anything you'd like to leave our f- folks with? Any bits of wisdom, yeah. some insights, or uh, uh, stock tips? Or <laughs> no, no stock tips. Not going there. One, I would say the the security outcome studies are ones that we want to do every year. So there will be a version three. So I'd say keep your eye out for that. We're going to go deeper again into these five things to see where we can learn from them and, and, and things we can take away from them, number one. Number two, I'd say make sure that you, as a CISO or a security leader, that going back to our earlier conversation, that you do have that network of people that you can bounce ideas off of because it can get really lonely running a security program and it can be get really easy for you to feel like the whole world's on your own shoulders. Have a, have a community of people that disabuse you of that notion because you're not on your own and there's lots of resources like this podcast that, that can help you make it through your day. So, so take advantage of that. Well, I think that's some wonderful insight. So thank you very much. This has been Helen Patton, advisory CISO for Cisco. Great person in terms of her career, her insights, and hopefully you found some wisdom here that she can share with you and you can apply in your lives and in your career. This is G. Mark Hardy for CISO Tradecraft. We thank you for listening in on our episode and we ask you to please follow us. And if you like us, give us some thumbs up on some of the podcasts so that we can help improve our rankings and other people can learn about us. Until the next time, stay safe out there.